So today I'll be talking about uh, where we are in terms of state of the art in machine learning and where do we go from here, right? So today machine learning happens at scale. You know, deep learning is where uh, there is enormous performance boost in many domains, especially domains where we have large amounts of labeled data. And, oh wow, okay. So I guess it just, sorry about that. And once uh, we want to do machine learning at scale, we want it to be distributed, right? So it happens on uh, uh, multiple GPUs within the same machine. It can happen on multiple machines over a network. So how do we design frameworks uh, that give us the benefit of scaling out to multiple machines and reduce the overhead, reduce the communication bottlenecks, and at the same time make it easy for the programmer to deploy these large scale models without extensive background, either in parallel programming, without extensive right, work. Uh, because models are constantly changing, people want to try out new frameworks, and most of them only work when you have the scale. Right? The, it's not like you can prototype on a small data set and then move to the larger one. Many of them just only work at scale, and they don't work with uh, small data and small models. And so for that, you need uh, uh, frameworks that easily also let you uh, scale up uh, to a large number of machines and uh, give you that efficiency. And at uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, we always put the customer first. And for us, you know, having cost savings uh, for our customers when they run on the cloud, where I, when we give them efficient frameworks is of utmost importance. So this is something while we are uh, passionately working on and also contributing to open source. So I'll talk about the MXNet effort that uh, enables uh, doing distributed deep learning at scale. And the last part you know, of uh, now scaling out to multiple dimensions uh, is something at the core of my research. Uh, you know, for the past five years or so, I've been working on extending methods beyond matrices to tensors. Right? So one way to view deep learning is multiple layers of linear algebraic operations with some nonlinearities. Right? So, but uh, why do we only limit to matrix operations? You know, why can't we go up to higher dimensions? And what would that entail? And so I'll uh, describe our latest works that brings the world of tensors and deep learning together and see like, what gains it can provide uh, in terms of network compression, in terms of being able to exploit multiple modalities, uh, in terms of being able to do uh, uh, much higher order predictions, so, so there's a lot of benefit you can get by exploiting the dimensions. And so in summary, this talk is about how uh, machine learning today is deep, distributed, and multidimensional. So as I'm sure all of you uh, have seen, uh, deep learning is very much in the news. It's uh, touched every domain uh, possible uh, and is going to new domains. It all started with uh, the image understanding domain, right? So the ImageNet contest is where uh, uh, deep learning framework for the first time gave a significant performance boost compared to the classical machine learning frameworks. And uh, you know, two things were responsible there. One was ImageNet uh, was at least an order of magnitude bigger than the earlier data sets, so you had more data. And also our compute technology drastically improved in the last decade. So you had these modern GPUs that could run these operations at scale. And since then, we've made rapid progress. Uh, you know, we have now uh, deep learning uh, systems deployed uh, almost universally, uh, including at Amazon Web Services. We have the recognition API for computer vision. And since then, we've also moved to a number of other domains, right? So speech recognition, uh, deep learning has given enormous boost. Natural language processing uh, is a more challenging task, especially because getting annotated data is expensive. 
Uh, but even there, we are making progress every day. And lastly, you know, autonomous driving or any application that involves deep learning in a control loop, which involves decision making, uh, is one of the most challenging tasks. And again, there we are making uh, rapid progress in uh, deep RL and safe RL. So, you know, lots of exciting areas to work on. Um, indeed, uh, the canonical uh, deep network has these stacked layers of operations. And if it comes to image recognition, you start out with convolutional layers, and then you move to these uh, fully connected layers at the end. And uh, the intuition is convolution operation enables you to exploit the spatial information efficiently uh, because it extracts features in a translation invariant manner. So it doesn't matter where the object is in the image, it extracts the same features. And so this is a network that you are all aware of. What I want to spend more time talking about is how do we deploy such networks at scale? Right? So the network that I've shown here is the Inception V3 network, one of the uh, state-of-the-art networks. Um, right? So you can see that it has more than 100 layers. It has you know, somewhat complicated set of loops and branches. Uh, so there are all these operations that happen. In fact, a billion operation per image. So this is not something you can program from scratch. So that's where a lot of effort has gone in the recent years to develop efficient uh, software frameworks you know, that make it easy for programmers to easily write down such a complex architecture at the same time is efficient uh, you know, as you scale up uh, these networks, as you include more and more GPUs, you get uh, the corresponding benefit in terms of throughput, right? So ideally, you want it to be uh, linear scaling, so you double the number of GPUs, you want the throughput to double. Uh, does that happen in practice? So what are the frameworks that enable that? So, so that's the second consideration. And the last one is portability. So we want now the flexibility of having deep learning on multiple different platforms according to the needs, including deep learning on the edge. Um, so AWS has AWS Greengrass for enabling IoT, and we are uh, always looking for efficient frameworks for doing deep learning on the edge. And MXNet also offers good support in that space. And so that's the idea, like how we can enable these large networks, make it easy for the programmer, it get high efficiency. So MXNet, the name stands for mixed network or mixed paradigm of programming. Uh, the idea is, you know, it started out uh, by thinking about the two paradigms, the imperative and declarative style of programming. And it turns out imperative is Python-like, you just write what you need to do, right, line by line. And that's the most natural way for humans to think and easy to code. Uh, but it doesn't give you good performance out of the box. Uh, and that's why declarative programming was preferred. In fact, some of the earliest packages started with that, including TensorFlow, uh, started with declarative programming, where you first declare the variables, you, know, you uh, talk about the relationships between them, and then uh, you, know, you can instantiate that. Right? And declarative programming is quite important if you want to do parallelization. Uh, so first I'll uh, show how you can do parallelization given uh, a declarative program that generates the symbolic graph, and then show how MXNet now has a new uh, imperative uh, API that makes it easy to write imperative code, but you can generate declarative code uh, by just writing the imperative one. Right, so this uh, example is a toy example of two GPUs and a CPU. And you want to uh, run, uh, you know, you'd want to do data parallelism. You want to split up your data into these two GPUs, run your forward and backward pass, aggregate the gradients uh, out in the CPU. Right, so you can see that even just this simple network and just two GPUs, it gets very complex, right? So I'm 
making a point here that the classical frameworks like MPI that supported parallel programming are no longer uh, you know, the right uh, framework for deep learning because they're too low level and complicated. Right. So one feature that uh, MXNet supports is given this uh, symbolic graph of computation, it auto parallelizes. So meaning you just write your code, it figures out, give as it traverses the graph that in this simple example, that these two parts of the program can be done in parallel, so it auto parallelizes. So this removes a lot of effort from the programmer to specify uh, such operations. And then the other part it supports is an efficient parameter server, right? So let me uh, show what it means in the context of uh, data parallelism. So data parallelism is the simplest form of parallelism because what you do is you take your uh, big batch of data and then uh, divide it into each of the machines, right? So each uh, machine has its own mini batch to process. And um, after processing that mini batch, what it does is uh, computes each GPU in this example, computes its own gradient and then pushes it out to the central server, right, a key value store, which aggregates it and then uh, uh, pushes it back to each of the GPUs. So you have this iterative operation at the end of each mini batch happening. Right, so as you can see, this is communication heavy and that's what makes it challenging. That's what makes it different from the traditional MapReduce operations that were meant to be doing one time rather than this iterative one. And so what MXNet does is uh, reduce this bottlenecks in several ways. So one approach is to do it in a hierarchical way, right? So where you place the parameter server is important. And if you're operating on GPUs, you want to designate one of the GPUs itself as the parameter server, the level one server. Because if you see, the most of the communication happens is in terms of uh, the individual GPUs sharing their gradients. And uh, you know, by having it here, uh, you reduce the communication bottleneck significantly. Because if you see, uh, the bandwidth for GPU to GPU communication is much more uh, when it comes to CPU to GPU communication. And indeed, with the latest technology, this is even getting faster. And uh, so by moving uh, most of the communication to within GPUs and the computation to GPUs, we are uh, able to have uh, much better efficiency and speed. So let me show you uh, just one experiment on how if, uh, MXNet is efficient at scale. Uh, there is a GitHub repository with a whole list of experiments and details, so you're welcome to uh, visit that. And so here what we did was uh, we took the uh, EC2 P2 16x large instance uh, these are the K40 um, NVIDIA GPUs. In fact, we have the P3s recently launched, uh, which are the older GPUs, so it's very exciting that uh, we have the latest GPUs available on the cloud. Uh, but these experiments are still older. So in this example, uh, what we uh, did was we kept the uh, mini batch size in each GPU to be constant, and then we kept increasing the number of GPUs. And uh, so, and what we wanted to see was how much time was spent per batch, right? So ideally, this curve should be flat uh, because you just keep adding your GPUs, so you're ideally uh, linearly scaling your throughput and adding no overhead, right? So that would be the ideal scenario, and that would mean it's flat. And you can see as the batch size increases, you do have a lower uh, overhead. Uh, you know, it's more efficient. And that's uh, because uh, you are reducing the communication bottleneck. The fraction of uh, communication cost is uh, reducing as you increase the mini batch size. And what we've seen with MXNet uh, experiments is overall you get about 91% efficiency. Uh, that's um, uh, the you know, highest efficiency recorded uh, in these frameworks. And uh, also you can, uh, we had larger experiments, you know, in some of the other experiments we even went up to 256 GPUs and it only reduced to 88% efficiency. So the idea is you have, you can seamlessly scale up uh, 
to multiple GPUs within the same machine as well as to multiple machines and retain a high efficiency. And so you have uh, enormous cost savings if you are running these large scale models and especially if you're running them continuously. Right, so uh, the latest uh, framework within MXNet is Gluon. Uh, so Gluon is the high level API with MXNet backend that we recently released uh, a few months ago. And uh, what I would argue is it tries to combine the best of features from all the previous frameworks. Uh, it is the latest uh, one to be released. And so what's special about Gluon is you can write simple imperative code Right, so in this example, what I'm showing here is uh, you're initializing two arrays, you're doing simple multiplication and addition. Right, so if you had only this imperative program, you couldn't generate the symbolic graph, the computation graph that's needed to say what the set of operations are, what the variables are. Uh, but what MXNet uh, with Gluon does is it automatically generates the symbolic program. So this program, a hybridization process gets you the symbolic program for free and also does many automatic optimizations. Uh, you know, I talked about um, auto parallelism, but in addition, it does memory optimizations. So for in this example here, you know, you're multiplying A and B and then you're immediately summing up. So this intermediate result does not need a unique chunk of memory, right? It can be overwritten. So all these optimizations can be easily done once you have the symbolic graph. And there's also a more complex operator fusion that would give us further speed ups um, once uh, we have this symbolic graph. So it has a lot of uh, optimizations built in for memory, for efficiency, and at the same time, it's easy to program. Yeah, so to summarize, uh, Gluon combines best of both the worlds. It's easy to write an imperative style, and at the same time, it has the efficiency of symbolic programs. So I want to now uh, break from the slides and show some uh, notebooks on um, Gluon. So this um, uh, is a set of tutorials. Uh, the primary contributor is uh, Zachary Lipton, on my team uh, who is uh, also finishing up his PhD from UC San Diego. So you can see here there is an extensive set of tutorials. You know, it, by the way, whether you're a beginner or an expert, I think you will find good use of these tutorials. Uh, for beginners, there are uh, many, you know, uh, options from scratch. So you can either uh, try out uh, building a multi-layer perceptron network from scratch or uh, directly in Gluon and see the difference, like how it's just one line or a few lines in Gluon. Uh, but at the same time, if you want to dig deeper into what each of these principles are, so there is the option of also looking at the code from scratch. So you have this almost two sets of options, one for the experts, one for the beginners. And so that helps you also quickly get up to speed. So what I want to show here is how easy it is to get high performance and run multiple um, GPU and multiple machine code. Uh, so I won't run the notebooks because of the, uh, you know, I want to cover on tensors as well. But what I want to show here is, you know, so you write your, you define your network here, right? So you're defining now a convolutional layer, max pooling layer, and uh, flattening it, doing a dense layer. And if you want to now initialize this network on multiple GPUs, uh, it's as simple as just these two lines of code. Right, so multiple GPUs on the same machine, all you say what your context is, what your GPUs are, and uh, then you're initializing uh, the network to collect parameters from these GPUs. Right, and what uh, you do is, and to split the data, all you have to do is uh, have this uh, instruction. And so you can see that everything happens in the back end, and so it's uh, really like whether it's one GPU or multiple GPUs in the same machine, right, it's, uh, the complexity is almost the same. So training with multiple machines is a bit more involved, but not by much. So as I said, the key value store is the parameter server. 
If you wanted it to be in a single machine, you would create it as local. But if you want it to be multiple machine, you create a distributed key value store, and then you want to specify where the pull and push operations are. So I won't go into the details here, but uh, given this tutorial, you can see that it's uh, also very easy to scale it up to multiple machines. So the last part I wanted to show is uh, how to convert imperative code to uh, generating symbolic graphs um, in Gluon. And the benefit of this is portability, right? Because once you have symbolic graphs, you can run it across different uh, platforms. And uh, so in this case, again, we are taking a network, in this case, uh, multiple layers of fully connected networks and as you can see, this is um, you know, uh, being uh, initialized. So if you do it in this way, this is still an imperative program, right? You're writing a set of instructions, and uh, you're initializing uh, your network. And uh, you know, if you output what the network weights are, it is just what has been initialized. So now, instead, you can convert it into a symbolic program by saying net.ibridize. So just this uh, one uh, line of instruction will get you the symbolic graph. And you can see this hybridization process, even in the simple case, has a significant performance boost. Because once you uh, generate the symbolic program, uh, then uh, the backend can do all the optimizations uh, for speed and also efficiency. And so getting the symbolic program is now, uh, you know, you can output the JSON file, and you can see like what the uh, different uh, operations are, what the nodes are. So you can now have this be portable. And so Gluon enables all this to be done uh, quite seamlessly. So I encourage you to look at the uh, notebooks uh, for, you know, it's very detailed and uh, also contribute to it. We have over uh, 50 contributors. We've had uh, more than 200,000 page views. Uh, so it's a very active community that's uh, forming both here and also in China. Uh, so there is, uh, you know, something that I would like more people to participate in. Um, because also because one of our uh, goals at uh, AWS is to democratize AI and have it be accessible to everybody on the planet. And this is one of the uh, you know, thoughts going behind uh, open source frameworks and uh, having uh, educational resources. So now let me switch gears and say, you know, deep learning is great, but where do we grow from here, right? So what are uh, some ways to take deep learning from where it is to the future? And I would argue that incorporating multiple dimensions uh, is a way to take it to the next level. And I also want to call out that later in the day, Tammy Calder is giving a talk on tensors, and she'll bring a perspective on tensor decompositions. So I'm happy to see more tensors uh, uh, come to the mainstream. Right, so indeed, the world around us has tensors. Right, so this is a toy example of how you want to think about tensors. You know, we start from scalars, uh, which are single numbers, to vectors, right? One dimensional matrices are two dimensional, and tensors uh, involve higher dimensions. And if you think about our data, right, how we express it, it's inherently uh, multi dimensional. So even in the uh, uh, canonical example of deep learning uh, for image recognition, what you have as an input uh, is uh, an image with width and height and typically RGB or some number of channels. And as it goes through convolutional layers, you have uh, you know, these number of channels increase. And if you're doing spatial pooling, you have the dimensions decrease. Right? So you have, the, you know, if you want to think about uh, deep networks in terms of tensors, one way is to think of it as uh, a box that is operating on tensors, right? It's transforming in an input tensor into an output tensor. And in most cases, that output tensor may be just a vector if you're doing image recognition. But if you're doing picks to picks, you know, that it's itself could be also a three-dimensional object. 
So thinking of it in this way, we want to then ask if you are transforming one tensor to another through a deep network, why not incorporate operations on tensors in all the layers? Right? So that was the thinking. So the first thing we wanted to do was, what are these set of operations? How do we uh, extend matrix operations to tensors? So the primitive for that is extending matrix products to now tensor products. Right? So uh, this uh, picture here is self-explanatory. If you want to multiply a matrix with a vector here, you take linear combinations of the columns. And now uh, with the three-dimensional tensor, you have options to multiply in multiple different uh, directions. And in this example, now I've contracted along two of them, and you can see that it's taking multilinear combinations of the fibers. Right? So you can now uh, operate on tensors in different ways. You can now you know, operate along the individual dimensions. You can even operate jointly along multiple dimensions. So there is a very rich set of operations that we can do on tensors uh, that just you know, is a, it's a very smaller part of it that can be done on matrices. So tensors really expand uh, uh, the transformations we can do from our input to the output uh, in these deep networks. And so what we started with was uh, one of the oldest uh, deep networks, that's the AlexNet, right? So as you can see here, uh, you start with the RGB image, and then you go through these convolutional layers uh, that are increasing the number of channels and doing spatial pooling. Uh, but what happens is once you come to the fully connected layers, right, this is where you lose the three-dimensional structure. So in the traditional AlexNet, what you do is you convert this three-dimensional object into one-dimensional vector, you flatten it, and then you send it through a matrix product operation, do some nonlinearities in multiple layers, and then output the final vector. And so the first thing we said was, why not uh, retain tensor operations throughout the network end-to-end? Right, so we keep the three-dimensional structure, and let's see what benefit that gives us. And uh, so the operations uh, we added were the tensor contraction. So once you have the output of this uh, convolutional layer, you don't flatten it, but instead you contract it across the multiple dimensions, and the output is still another tensor, typically of a lower, smaller size because you're doing uh, uh, in these layers, you're either retaining the size or shrinking the size, right? And so you can do multiple layers of that with nonlinearity, and we wanted to see what benefit this would give. Uh, I mean, this is just a symbolic graph in uh, MXNet if you want to uh, apply it through matrix products by doing uh, transpositions. And so what we found was uh, with VGG and AlexNet, uh, we got a huge amount of space savings have, while having uh, almost no performance drop, right? So as high as 65% in space savings in these fully connected layers. And so the idea is by, you know, simply just retaining the three-dimensional structure, right? So that's all we did. Uh, you can uh, get a huge space saving and a compressed network, right? So that says like the power of dimensionality that uh, we seem to be missing in many of these deep networks. And so many of my recent research has been to ask from here, where do we go and uh, try to exploit multiple dimensions in these networks. So the next thing we did was, let's also see at the output layer how we can uh, treat it as a tensor operations. Uh, because these uh, tensor contraction layers were the intermediate uh, layers that were replacing the fully connected layers. So in the last layer, we want to do a regression-like operation, right? Because we have this um, contracted tensor, the activation tensor as input, and then there is uh, the weight, uh, set of weights. And typically when you do this uh, in a product, right? So you get each coordinate of your output vector. That's the softmax. And so now what we did was we also parameterized the weights in this last layer as a low rank tensor. So if you parameterize the weights directly as a low rank matrix, the performance drops significantly. I mean, people have tried it, that's a bad idea. But instead, if you 
you know, instead think of it as a tensor and I express it as a low rank tensor. A low rank tensor will be a full rank matrix in general. So it has much higher uh, uh, representation power so you can reduce parameters without compromising on the rank of the effective matrix. And so that's the power that again uh, allows us to significantly compress uh, the output layer as well. So as you can see up to like 65% or 70%, there is hardly any drop in accuracy. And uh, so you can uh, reduce uh, uh, the uh, network size significantly even in the last layer. And so this framework had end-to-end -end operation of tensors. You can train it end-to-end -end and get uh, uh, this uh, savings in space. So, uh, you know, so I wanted to uh, now ask, uh, so given that tensor operations we believe are the future in deep networks, we want to like now also go a level lower and think about optimizing for these tensor operations effectively. So this is a work uh, I did uh, with NVIDIA researcher Chris Seca. And the question we wanted to ask was, even the simple operation, so you take a uh, tensor, you multiply it uh, with a matrix on one of the directions, right? There's a single index contraction. I mean, if you do it, try to do it naively, you uh, lose out quite a bit. In fact, in some of uh, small to moderate sized tensors, uh, the way you would have to do it is to transpose both the tensor and the matrix, transpose the output uh, for different, you know, if you want to contract in different directions. And this loses, uh, uh, you know, you spend a lot of time just doing transpositions, and also you're doubling or tripling your memory requirements, right, because you're doing explicit copy. And what we've seen with all the development of matrix libraries is we have in-place transpose, meaning you don't explicitly transpose when you're doing matrix product. If you type the command A transpose B, there's no A transpose explicitly formed. Right, so our goal was to have similar uh, capabilities for tensors as well. So can we just do this in place? Can we try to do it at the same cost as a single gem map operation? That's a matrix multiplication operations and avoid these transpositions. So I'll skip the details for the lack of time, but what we found was we could use existing primitives. I mean, there is something known as batched uh, general matrix multiplication primitive. And then we could uh, specialize it uh, by fixing the stride. Uh, I mean, those are details. Uh, but what we saw was uh, you, with that, you can nearly match the performance of a single gem operation. So you almost get the same efficiency as matrix multiplication operation. But now this is much richer, right? So this is contracting a three-dimensional tensor. And so to me, this is just the start. So if uh, you have expertise in this area, if you want to build efficient tensor kernels, right? So to me, tensor kernel is more than just an array kernel. So I, I know the word tensor gets thrown around a lot. To me, like tensor algebra, where you're doing contractions as a tensor object is very different from treating it as a multidimensional array. And so these operations are not present in any of the existing libraries, although the name tensor is very much attached to you know, many of these. And so that's where there is a need for extensive library development uh, in this area. And um, so what I want to show, and so we can get good space saving, I mean, uh, savings in time with this. So what I want to quickly show is uh, in terms of library development, uh, uh, one of my interns, uh, John Kosafi, uh, developed this Tensorly uh, library, and I've been involved since his internship. And this one uh, you know, allows you to code in Python. And recently, we also added MXNet and PyTorch backend. So you can easily combine your deep learning uh, with uh, uh, traditional tensor operations. So there are, again, notebooks um, on the repository. You can go and run them. And so I want to show you how easy it is to now also uh, incorporate the tensor contractions and regressions that I described uh, previously. And so here, the first part is just importing the libraries. You're loading your data. And so this is the new part, right? So you want to describe the tensor regression as a new layer in your network. And so you can easily do that as a glue-on block. 
So the part where the tensor operation is incorporated is first you define what the core and the products are, because if you recall, this was a Tucker form for the weight matrix. And there is just this one operation. So what you do is you transform your Tucker form. So the Tucker form involves keeping a core tensor as well as its factors. And in the tensor form, you multiply it out. So if you do that, you can obtain the weights of your network. And uh, you can also backprop through this. Yeah, so by combining uh, TensorLe package uh, with the MXNet and PyTorch backend, now you're free to try a variety of uh, different uh, tensor architectures. Um, I want to show you one other example that involves uh, visual question and answering. Uh, so in this case, uh, the task is to uh, take an image, right? There is a question about the image. You want to answer that. Uh, so again, this notebook is available with the Gluon tutorial, so you're, uh, you, know, you should go and check that out in detail there. And so here what we do is we want to combine, um, let me first describe it in the slides. So you want to combine the uh, image features and the text features together to answer uh, the question. Right, because once it's a question, you're processing it either through some sequence model, RNN, LSTM, right? So some model to get a text feature, and you're also processing your image to get an image feature. And now, you know, you need to in combine both of them to come up with the answer, right? So the traditionally, the simplest approach people took was to just uh, first flatten this Right, either do average pooling of this, get a vector out of this three-dimensional object, as well as take this vector, concatenate them. So just put them together, feed it to the network after that. Right? But it turns out you can get a significant performance boost by sketching on these objects. So a new sketch we proposed was to treat this, you know, this is a three-dimensional tensor. In this case, it's a one-dimensional tensor from text. So can we pool them directly? Can we take uh, tensor products of these to express higher order moments over image and text jointly? And at the same time, we don't want to blow up the dimensions. We don't want this network to be too huge because that may overfit. Uh, that may, you know, that's also hard to train. So instead, we can do efficient dimensionality reduction. And that's where the term sketching is uh, incorporated. Uh, so the details are, again, uh, in the paper. But uh, the idea here is uh, there is a notion of a sketch on the tensor and uh, your text vector. And you can pull them together in the FFT domain. Uh, it turns out that this is, uh, gives you properties of the count sketch, the traditional count sketch, but on tensors now. So there are interesting, again, uh, research um, as well as development in terms of how do we compress these uh, large multidimensional uh, data sets as well as incorporate higher order moments in this data set. Right? And so these are interesting uh, problems of research. And so there's also a notebook in Gluon that uh, you know, gives step-by-step -step explanation of how to do the pooling, how to you know, construct this network, how to train it. Uh, I encourage you to go and uh, look at the details there. Uh, and so the last part uh, now about tensors, right? So far, what we saw about tensors is you can contract tensors. So you can take the tensor, multiply it across multiple dimensions. So that tra transforms an input tensor to an other output tensor. You can do regression on tensors, so that way you can express your input and you have a weight matrix and get the output. And you can also use tensors to pool across different modalities and get higher order uh, moments of your data, but also get efficiency. So the last part about tensors is uh, how you can decompose them efficiently. Right? So just you can decompose a matrix into its low rank components. You can decompose the tensor in multiple different ways uh, into its low rank components. I described the Tucker form earlier. This is called the CP form. And uh, Tammy Calder will give you a lot more details on how to work on tensors, how to do tensor decompositions. What I want to point out is some of my previous work involved tensor decompositions. And one application was topic modeling. 
So you have a huge corpus of documents without any labels, right? So for this unsupervised learning task, how can you detect topics automatically? In this article here, you can see that you know, we can immediately parse this article as being about university, being about crime, right? being about sports, uh, but can the machine also automatically do this? And so we had a framework that involved uh, higher order moments of text frequencies. So you know, in what it was was looking at co-occurrence of multiple uh, words uh, in a text document, like how frequently do these words co-occur, and decompose that large tensor in an efficient way, and be able to discover what the topics are. Uh, so you know, we, these are dated experiments. We also have new experiments. And what the benefit that it gave us was very good uh, uh, perplexity or likelihood of uh, getting a good model uh, from this data set at the same time very high speed. And so tensors have uh, the potential to take matrix operations to the next level while retaining uh, speed and efficiency. Yeah, so in conclusion, I had a breadth of topics in this talk. Uh, you know, we have uh, deep learning revolutionizing many fields. And to enable it uh, at scale, we need distributed optimization. So MXNet offers uh, high efficiency across uh, multiple machines and at the same time, ease of programming so that you can directly start running on this uh, large uh, cluster. And the Gluon framework makes it easy to just write imperative code and get uh, symbolic uh, programs and have portability. And uh, tensors, I would argue, are the next level in deep learning uh, in that you can now generalize the operations to incorporating tensor contractions, regressions, tensor sketches, and exploit multiple modalities and dimensions in your data. Thank you. <laughs>